Ebel sepoys that have survived. A century ago the British arrived in Hindostan and gradually entertained troops in their service, and became masters of every state. Our forefathers have always served them, and we also entered their service. By the mercy of God and with our assistance the British also conquered every place they liked, in which thousands of us, Hindustani men were sacrificed, but we never made any excuses or pretenses nor revolted. But in the year 1857 the British issued an order that new cartridges and muskets which had arrived from England were to be issued, in the former of which the fats of cows and pigs were mixed, and also that atta of wheat mixed with powdered bones was to be eaten, and even distributed them in every regiment of infantry, cavalry, and artillery. They gave these cartridges to the sours, mounted soldiers, of the third light cavalry, and ordered them to bite them, the troopers objected to it and said that they would never bite them, for if they did, their religion and faith would be destroyed. Upon this the British officers paraded the men of the three regiments and having prepared 1,400 English soldiers, and other battalions of European troops and horse artillery, surrounded them, and placing six guns before each of the infantry regiments, loaded the guns with grape and made 84 new troopers prisoners, and put them in jail with irons on them. The reason that the sours of the cantonment were put into jail was that we should be frightened into biting the new cartridges. On this account we and all our countrymen having united together, have fought the British for the preservation of our faith, we have been compelled to make war for two years and the Rajas and chiefs who are with us in faith and religion, are still so, and have undergone all sorts of trouble, we have fought for two years in order that our faith and religion may not be polluted. If the religion of a Hindu or Musalman is lost, what remains in the world. Source 7. Villagers as Rebels. An officer reporting from rural Awad, spelt as Uday in the following account, noted. The Uday people are gradually pressing down on the line of communication from the north, the Uday people are villagers, these villagers are nearly intangible to Europeans melting away before them and collecting again. The civil authorities report these villagers to amount to a very large number of men, with the number of guns. What, according to this account, were the problems faced by the British in dealing with these villagers? Theme 12. Colonial cities. Urbanization, planning, and architecture. In this chapter we will discuss the process of urbanization in colonial India, explore the distinguishing characteristics of colonial cities and track social changes within them. We will look closely at developments in three big cities Madras, China, Calcutta, Kolkata, and Bombay, Mumbai. All three were originally fishing and weaving villages. They became important centers of trade due to the economic activities of the English East India Company. Company agents settled in Madras in 1639 and in Calcutta in 1690. Bombay was given to the company in 1661 by the English king, who had got it as part of his wife's dowry from the king of Portugal. The company established trading and administrative offices in each of these settlements. By the middle of the 19th century these settlements had become big cities from where the new rulers controlled the country. Institutions were set up to regulate economic activity and demonstrate the authority of the new rulers. Indians experienced political domination in new ways in these cities. The layouts of Madras, Bombay, and Calcutta were quite different from older Indian towns, and the buildings that were built in these cities bore the marks of their colonial origin. What do buildings express and what can architecture convey? This is a question that students of history need to ask. Remember that architecture helps in giving ideas a shape in stone, brick, wood, or plaster. From the bungalow of the government officer, the palatial house of the rich merchant to the humble hut of the laborer, buildings reflect social relations and identities in many ways. 1. Towns and cities in pre-colonial times. Before we explore the growth of cities in the colonial period, let us look at urban centers during the centuries preceding British rule. 1.1 What gave towns their character? Towns were often defined in opposition to rural areas. They came to represent specific forms of economic activities and cultures. In the countryside people subsisted by cultivating land, foraging in the forest, 
or rearing animals. Towns by contrast were peopled with artisans, traders, administrators, and rulers. Towns dominated over the rural population, thriving on the surplus and taxes derived from agriculture. Towns and cities were often fortified by walls which symbolized their separation from the countryside. However, the separation between town and country was fluid. Peasants traveled long distances on pilgrimage, passing through towns, they also flocked to towns during times of famine. Besides, there was a reverse flow of humans and goods from towns to villages. When towns were attacked, people often sought shelter in the countryside. Traders and peddlers took goods from the towns to sell in the villages, extending markets and creating new patterns of consumption. During the 16th and 17th centuries the towns built by the Mughals were famous for their concentration of populations, their monumental buildings and their imperial grandeur and wealth. Agra, Delhi and Lahore were important centers of imperial administration and control. Mansabdars and Jagirdars who were assigned territories in different parts of the empire usually maintained houses in these cities, residence in these centers of power was symbolic of the status and prestige of a noble. The presence of the emperor and noblemen in these centers meant that a wide variety of services had to be provided. Artisans produced exclusive handicrafts for the households of nobles. Grain from the countryside was brought into urban markets for the town dwellers and the army. The treasury was also located in the imperial capital. Thus the revenues of the kingdom flowed into the capital regularly. The emperor lived in a fortified palace and the town was enclosed by a wall, with entry and exit being regulated by different gates. Within these towns were gardens, mosques, temples, tombs, colleges, bazaars and caravanserais. The focus of the town was oriented towards the palace and the principal mosque. In the towns of South India such as Madurai and Kanchipuram the principal focus was the temple. These towns were also important commercial centers. Religious festivals often coincided with fairs, linking pilgrimage with trade. Generally, the ruler was the highest authority and the principal patron of religious institutions. The relationship that he had with other groups and classes determined their place in society and in the town. Medieval towns were places where everybody was expected to know their position in the social order dominated by the ruling elite. In North India, Maintaining this order was the work of the imperial officer called the Kotwal who oversaw the internal affairs and policing of the town. 1.2 Changes in the 18th Century All this started changing in the 18th century. With political and commercial realignments, old towns went into decline and new towns developed. The gradual erosion of Mughal power led to the demise of towns associated with their rule. The Mughal capitals, Delhi and Agra, lost their political authority. The growth of new regional powers was reflected in the increasing importance of regional capitals Lucknow, Hyderabad, Seringapatam, Pune, present-day Pun, Nagpur, Baroda, present-day Vadodara, and Tanjore, present-day Tanjavur. Traders, administrators, artisans, and others migrated from the old Mughal centers to these new capitals in search of work and patronage. Continuous warfare between the new kingdoms meant that mercenaries too found ready employment there. Some local notables and officials associated with Mughal rule in North India also used this opportunity to create new urban settlements such as the Kasbah and Ganja. However, the effects of political decentralization were uneven. In some places there was renewed economic activity, in other places war, plunder, and political uncertainty led to economic decline. Changes in the networks of trade were reflected in the history of urban centers. The European Commercial companies had set up base in different places early during the Mughal era, the Portuguese in Panaji in 1510, the Dutch in Masulaputnam in 1605, the British in Madras in 1639 and the French in Pondicherry, present-day Puducherry, in 1673. With the expansion of commercial activity, towns grew around these trading centers. By the end of the 18th century the land-based empires in Asia were replaced by the powerful sea-based European empires. Forces of international trade, mercantilism, and capitalism now came to define the nature of society. 
From the mid-18th century, there was a new phase of change. Commercial centers such as Surat, Masulaputnam, and Dhaka, which had grown in the 17th century, declined when trade shifted to other places. As the British gradually acquired political control after the Battle of Plassey in 1757, and the trade of the English East India Company expanded, colonial port cities such as Madras, Calcutta, and Bombay rapidly emerged as the new economic capitals. They also became centers of colonial administration and political power. New buildings and institutions developed, and urban spaces were ordered in new ways. New occupations developed and people flocked to these colonial cities. By about 1800, they were the biggest cities in India in terms of population. 2. Finding out about colonial cities. 2.1 Colonial Records and Urban History Colonial rule was based on the production of enormous amounts of data. The British kept detailed records of their trading activities in order to regulate their commercial affairs. To keep track of life in the growing cities, they carried out regular surveys, gathered statistical data, and published various official reports. From the early years, the colonial government was keen on mapping. It felt that good maps were necessary to understand the landscape and know the topography. This knowledge would allow better control over the region. When towns began to grow, maps were prepared not only to plan the development of these towns but also to develop commerce and consolidate power. The town maps give information regarding the location of hills, rivers, and vegetation, all important for planning structures for defense purposes. They also show the location of ghats, density, and quality of houses and alignment of roads used to gauge commercial possibilities and plan strategies of taxation. From the late 19th century the British tried to raise money for administering towns through the systematic annual collection of municipal taxes. To avoid conflict they handed over some responsibilities to elected Indian representatives. Institutions like the municipal corporation with some popular representation were meant to administer essential services such as water supply, sewerage, road building, and public health. The activities of municipal corporations in turn generated a whole new set of records maintained in municipal record rooms. The growth of cities was monitored through regular headcounts. By the mid-19th century several local censuses had been carried out in different regions. The first All India Census was attempted in 1872. Thereafter, from 1881, decennial, conducted every 10 years, censuses became a regular feature. This collection of data is an invaluable source for studying urbanization in India. When we look at these reports it appears that we have hard data to measure historical change. The endless pages of tables on disease and death or the enumeration of people according their age, sex, caste, and occupation, provide a vast mass of figures that creates an illusion of concreteness. Historians have, however, found that the figures can be misleading. Before we use these figures we need to understand who collected the data, and why and how they were gathered. We also need to know what was measured and what was not. The census operation, for instance, was a means by which social data were converted into convenient statistics about the population. But this process was riddled with ambiguity. The census commissioners devised categories for classifying different sections of the population. This classification was often arbitrary and failed to capture the fluid and overlapping identities of people. How was a person who was both an artisan and a trader to be classified? How was a person who cultivated his land and carted produce to the town to be enumerated? Was he a cultivator or a trader? Often people themselves refused to cooperate or gave evasive answers to the census officials. For a long while they were suspicious of census operations and believed that inquiries were being conducted to impose new taxes. Upper caste people were also unwilling to give any information regarding the women of their household, women were supposed to remain secluded within the interior of the household and not subjected to public gaze or public inquiry. Census officials also found that people were claiming identities that they associated with higher status. For instance there were people in towns who were hawkers and went selling small articles during some seasons, 
while in other seasons they earned their livelihood through manual labor. Such people often told the census enumerators that they were traders, not laborers, for they regarded trade as a more respectable activity. Similarly, the figures of mortality and disease were difficult to collect, for all deaths were not registered, and illness was not always reported, nor treated by licensed doctors. How then could cases of illness or death be accurately calculated? Thus historians have to use sources like the census with great caution, keeping in mind their possible biases, recalculating figures and understanding what the figures do not tell. However, census, survey maps and records of institutions like the municipality help us to study colonial cities in greater detail than is possible for pre-colonial cities. 2.2 Trends of Change A careful study of censuses reveals some fascinating trends. After 1800, urbanization in India was sluggish. All through the 19th century up to the first two decades of the 20th, the proportion of the urban population to the total population in India was extremely low and had remained stagnant. This is clear from figure 12.5. In the 40 years between 1900 and 1940 the urban population increased from about 10 percenter of the total population to about 13 percenter. Beneath this picture of changelessness, there were significant variations in the patterns of urban development in different regions. The smaller towns had little opportunity to grow economically. Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras on the other hand grew rapidly and soon became sprawling cities. In other words, the growth of these three cities as the new commercial and administrative centers was at the expense of other existing urban centers. As the hub of the colonial economy, they functioned as collection depots for the export of Indian manufactures such as cotton textiles in the 18th and 19th centuries. After the Industrial Revolution in England, this trend was reversed and these cities instead became the entry point for British manufactured goods and for the export of Indian raw materials. The nature of this economic activity sharply differentiated these colonial cities from India's traditional towns and urban settlements. The introduction of railways in 1853 meant a change in the fortunes of towns. Economic activity Gradually shifted away from traditional towns which were located along old routes and rivers. Every railway station became a collection depot for raw materials and a distribution point for imported goods. For instance, Mirzapur on the Ganges, which specialized in collecting cotton and cotton goods from the Deccan, declined when a railway link was made to Bombay. With the expansion of the railway network, railway workshops and railway colonies were established. Railway towns like Jamalpur, Waltyar and Bareilly developed. 3. What were the new towns like? 3.1 Ports, Forts and Centers for Services By the 18th century Madras, Calcutta and Bombay had become important ports. The settlements that came up here were convenient points for collecting goods. The English East India Company built its factories, i.e., mercantile offices, there and because of competition among the European companies, fortified these settlements for protection. In Madras, Fort St. George, in Calcutta Fort William and in Bombay the fort marked out the areas of British settlement. Indian merchants, artisans, and other workers who had economic dealings with European merchants lived outside these forts and settlements of their own. Thus, from the beginning there were separate quarters for Europeans and Indians, which came to be labeled in contemporary writings as the White Town and Black Town respectively. Once the British captured political power these racial distinctions became sharper. From the mid-19th century the expanding network of railways linked these cities to the rest of the country. As a result the hinterland the countryside from where raw materials and labor were drawn became more closely linked to these port cities. Since raw material was transported to these cities for export and there was plentiful cheap labor available, it was convenient to set up modern factories there. After the 1850s, cotton mills were set up by Indian merchants and entrepreneurs in Bombay, and European-owned jute mills were established on the outskirts of Calcutta. This was the beginning of modern industrial development in India. Although Calcutta, Bombay and Madras supplied raw materials for industry in England, and had emerged because of modern economic forces like capitalism, 
their economies were not primarily based on factory production. The majority of the working population in these cities belonged to what economists classify as the tertiary sector. There were only two proper industrial cities, Kanpur, specializing in leather, woolen and cotton textiles, and Jamshedpur, specializing in steel. India never became a modern industrialist country, since discriminatory colonial policies limited the levels of industrial development. Calcutta, Bombay and Madras grew into large cities, but this did not signify any dramatic economic growth for colonial India as a whole. 3.2 A New Urban Milieu Colonial cities reflected the mercantile culture of the new rulers. Political power and patronage shifted from Indian rulers to the merchants of the East India Company. Indians who worked as interpreters, middlemen, traders and suppliers of goods also had an important place in these new cities. Economic activity near the river or the sea led to the development of docks and ghats. Along the shore were go-downs, mercantile offices, insurance agencies for shipping, transport depots, banking establishments. Further inland were the chief administrative offices of the company. The writer's building in Calcutta was one such office. Around the periphery of the fort, European merchants and agents built palatial houses. In European styles. Some built garden houses in the suburbs. Racially exclusive clubs, race courses and theatres were also built for the ruling elite. The rich Indian agents and middlemen built large traditional courtyard houses in the black town in the vicinity of the bazaars. They bought up large tracts of land in the city as future investment. To impress their English masters they threw lavish parties during festivals. They also built temples to establish their status in society. The laboring poor provided a variety of services to their European and Indian masters as cooks, palanquin bearers, coachmen, guards, porters, and construction and dock workers. They lived in makeshift huts in different parts of the city. The nature of the colonial city changed further in the mid-19th century. After the revolt of 1857. British attitudes in India were shaped by a constant fear of rebellion. They felt that towns needed to be better defended, and white people had to live in more secure and segregated enclaves, away from the threat of the natives. Pasture lands and agricultural fields around the older towns were cleared, and new urban spaces called civil lines were set up. White people began to live in the civil lines. Cantonments places where Indian troops under European command were stationed were also developed as safe enclaves. These areas were separate from but attached to the Indian towns. With broad streets, bungalows set amidst large gardens, barracks, parade ground, and church, they were meant as a safe haven for Europeans as well as a model of ordered urban life in contrast to the densely built-up Indian towns. For the British, the black areas came to symbolize not only chaos and anarchy, but also filth and disease. For a long while the British were interested primarily in the cleanliness and hygiene of the white areas. But as epidemics of cholera and plague spread, killing thousands, colonial officials felt the need for more stringent measures of sanitation and public health. They feared that disease would spread from the black to the white areas. From the 1860s and 1870s, Stringent administrative measures regarding sanitation were implemented and building activity in the Indian towns was regulated. Underground piped water supply and sewerage and drainage systems were also put in place around this time. Sanitary vigilance thus became another way of regulating Indian towns. 3.3 The first hill stations As in the case of cantonments, hill stations were a distinctive feature of colonial urban development. The founding and settling of hill stations was initially connected with the needs of the British Army. Simla, present-day Shimla, was founded during the course of the Gurkha War, 1815-1816, the Anglo-Maratha War of 1818 led to British interest in Mount Abu, and Darjeeling was wrested from the rulers of Sikkim in 1835. Hill stations became strategic places for billeting troops, guarding frontiers, and launching campaigns against enemy rulers. The temperate and cool climate of the Indian hills was seen as an advantage, particularly since the British associated hot weather with epidemics. 
Cholera and malaria were particularly feared and attempts were made to protect the army from these diseases. The overwhelming presence of the army made these stations a new kind of cantonment in the hills. These hill stations were also developed as sanitariums, i.e., places where soldiers could be sent for rest and recovery from illnesses. Because the hill stations approximated the cold climates of Europe, they became an attractive destination for the new rulers. It became a practice for viceroys to move to hill stations during the summer months. In 1864 the viceroy John Lawrence officially moved his council to Simla, setting seal to the practice of shifting capitals during the hot season. Simla also became the official residence of the commander-in-chief of the Indian Army. In the hill stations the British and other Europeans sought to recreate settlements that were reminiscent of home. The buildings were deliberately built in the European style. Individual houses followed the pattern of detached villas and cottages set amidst gardens. The Anglican church and educational institutions represented British ideals. Even recreation activities came to be shaped by British cultural traditions. Thus social calls, teas, picnics, fates, races and visits to the theatre became common among colonial officials in the hill stations. The introduction of the railways made hill stations more accessible to a wide range of people including Indians. Up around middle class Indians such as Maharajas, lawyers and merchants were drawn to these stations because they afforded them a close proximity to the ruling British elite. Hill stations were important for the colonial economy. With the setting up of tea and coffee plantations in the adjoining areas, an influx of immigrant labor from the plains began. This meant that hill stations no longer remained exclusive racial enclaves for Europeans in India. 3.4 Social Life in the New Cities For the Indian population, the new cities were bewildering places where life seemed always in a flux. There was a dramatic contrast between extreme wealth and poverty. New transport facilities such as horse-drawn carriages and, subsequently, trams and buses meant that People could live at a distance from the city center. Over time there was a gradual separation of the place of work from the place of residence. Traveling from home to office or the factory was a completely new kind of experience. Also, though the sense of coherence and familiarity of the old towns was no longer there, the creation of public places for example, public parks, theaters and, from the 20th century, Cinema halls provided exciting new forms of entertainment and social interaction. Within the cities new social groups were formed and the old identities of people were no longer important. All classes of people were migrating to the big cities. There was an increasing demand for clerks, teachers, lawyers, doctors, engineers and accountants. As a result the middle classes increased. They had access to new educational institutions such as schools, colleges, and libraries. As educated people, they could put forward their opinions on society and government in newspapers, journals, and public meetings. A new public sphere of debate and discussion emerged. Social customs, norms, and practices came to be questioned. Social changes did not happen with ease. Cities, for instance, offered new opportunities for women. Middle-class women sought to express themselves through the medium of journals, autobiographies, and books. But many people resented these attempts to change traditional patriarchal norms. Conservatives feared that the education of women would turn the world upside down, and threaten the basis of the entire social order. Even reformers who supported women's education saw women primarily as mothers and wives, and wanted them to remain within the enclosed spaces of the household. Over time, Women became more visible in public, as they entered new professions in the city as domestic and factory workers, teachers, and theater and film actresses. But for a long time women who moved out of the household into public spaces remained the objects of social censure. Another new class within the cities was the laboring poor or the working class. Paupers from rural areas flocked to the cities in the hope of employment. Some saw cities as places of opportunity. Others were attracted by the allure of a different way of life, by the desire to see things they had never seen before. To minimize costs of living in the city, most male migrants left their families behind in their village homes. 
Life in the city was a struggle, jobs were uncertain, food was expensive, and places to stay were difficult to afford. Yet the poor often created a lively urban culture of their own. They were enthusiastic participants in religious festivals, tamashas, folk theater, and swangs, satires, which often mocked the pretensions of their masters, Indian and European. 10. Segregation, Town Planning and Architecture Madras, Calcutta and Bombay Madras, Calcutta and Bombay gradually developed into the biggest cities of colonial India. We have been examining some of the distinctive features of these cities in the preceding sections. Now we will look in detail at one characteristic for each city. 4.1 Settlement and Segregation in Madras The company had first set up its trading activities in the well-established port of Surat on the west coast. Subsequently the search for textiles brought British merchants to the east coast. In 1639 they constructed a trading post in Madras Batam. This settlement was locally known as Chinapatanam. The company had purchased the right of settlement from the local Telugu lords, the Nayaks of Kalahasti, who were eager to support trading activity in the region. Rivalry, 1746-1763, with the French East India Company led the British to fortify Madras and give their representatives increased political and administrative functions. With the defeat of the French in 1761, Madras became more secure and began to grow into an important commercial town. It was here that the superiority of the British and the subordinate position of the Indian merchants was most apparent. Fort St. George became the nucleus of the white town where most of the Europeans lived. Walls and bastions made this a distinct enclave. Color and religion determined who was allowed to live within the fort. The company did not permit any marriages with Indians. Other than the English, the Dutch, and Portuguese were allowed to stay here because they were European and Christian. The administrative and judicial systems also favored the white population. Despite being few in number the Europeans were the rulers and the development of Madras followed the needs and convenience of the minority whites in the town. The black town developed outside the fort. It was laid out in straight lines a characteristic of colonial towns. It was, however, demolished in the MID-1700S and the area was cleared for a security zone around the fort. A new black town developed further to the north. This housed weavers, artisans, middlemen, and interpreters who played a vital role in the company trade. The new black town resembled traditional Indian towns, with living quarters built around its own. Temple and Bazaar on the narrow lanes that crisscrossed the township, there were distinct caste-specific neighborhoods. Chintadripit was an area meant for weavers. Washermanpit was a colony of dyers and bleachers of cloth. Royapuram was a settlement for Christian boatmen who worked for the company. Madras developed by incorporating innumerable surrounding villages and by creating opportunities and spaces for a variety of communities. Several different communities came and settled in Madras performing a range of economic functions. The Dubashis were Indians who could speak two languages the local language and English. They worked as agents and merchants, acting as intermediaries between Indian society and the British. They used their privileged position in government to acquire wealth. Their powerful position in society was established by their charitable works and patronage of temples in the black town. Initially jobs with the company were monopolized by the Vel Allers, a rural caste who took advantage of the new opportunities provided by British rule. With the spread of English education in the 19th century, Brahmins started competing for similar positions in the administration. Telugu Komitas were a powerful commercial group that controlled the grain trade in the city. Gujarati bankers had also been present since the 18th century. Para Iyars and Van Iyars formed the laboring poor. The Nawab of Arkat settled in nearby Triplicane which became the nucleus of a substantial Muslim settlement. Mylapore and Triplicane were earlier Hindu religious centers that supported a large group of Brahmins. Santhom with its cathedral was the center for Roman Catholics. All these settlements became part of Madras city. Thus the incorporation of many villages made Madras a city of wide expanse and low density. This was noticed by European travelers and commented on by officials. 
As the British consolidated their power, resident Europeans began to move out of the fort. Garden houses first started coming up along the two main arteries Mount Road and Punamalaya Road leading from the fort to the cantonment. Wealthy Indians too started to live like the English. As a result many new suburbs were created from existing villages around the core of Madras. This was of course possible because the wealthy could afford transport. The poor settled in villages that were close to their place of work. The gradual urbanization of Madras meant that the areas between these villages were brought within the city. As a result Madras had a semi-rural air about it. 4.2 Town Planning in Calcutta Modern town planning began in the colonial cities. This required preparation of a layout of the entire urban space and regulation of urban land use. Planning was usually inspired by a vision of what the city should look like, how it would be developed and the way in which spaces would be organized and ordered. The ideology of development that this vision reflected presumed exercise of state power over urban lives and urban spaces. There were many reasons why the British took upon themselves the task of town planning from the early years of their rule in Bengal. One immediate reason was defense. In 1756, Siraj Adala, the Nawab of Bengal, attacked Calcutta and sacked the small fort which the British traders had built as their depot for goods. The English East India Company traders had been continuously questioning the sovereignty of the Nawab. They were reluctant to pay customs duties, and refused to comply with the terms on which they were expected to operate. So Siraj Adala wanted to assert his authority. Subsequently, in 1757, when Siraj Adala was defeated in the Battle of Plassey, the East India Company decided to build a new fort, one that could not be easily attacked. Calcutta had grown from three villages called Sudanati, Kolkata, and Govindapur. The company cleared a site in the southernmost village of Govindapur and the traders and weavers living there were asked to move out. Around the new Fort William they left a vast open space which came to be locally known as the Maidan or Garamath. This was done so that there would be no obstructions to a straight line of fire from the fort against an advancing enemy army. Once the British became more confident about their permanent presence in Calcutta, they started moving out of the fort and building residences along the periphery of the Maidan. That was how the English settlement in Calcutta gradually started taking shape. The vast open space around the fort, which still exists, became a landmark, Calcutta's first significant town planning measure. The history of town planning in Calcutta of course did not end with the building of Fort William and the Maidan. In 1798, Lord Wellesley became the Governor General. He built a massive palace, government house, for himself in Calcutta, a building that was expected to convey the authority of the British. He became concerned about the condition of the Indian part of the city the crowding, the excessive vegetation, the dirty tanks, the smells and poor drainage. These conditions worried the British because they believed at the time that poisonous gases from marshlands and pools of stagnant water were the cause of most diseases. The tropical climate itself was seen as unhealthy and enervating. Creating open places in the city was one way of making the city healthier. Wellesley wrote a minute, an administrative order, in 1803 on the need for town planning, and set up various committees for the purpose. Many bazaars, ghats, burial grounds, and tanneries were cleared or removed. From then on the notion of public health became an idea that was proclaimed in projects of town clearance and town planning. After Wellesley's departure the work of town planning was carried on by the Lottery Committee, 1817, with the help of the government. The Lottery Committee was so named because funds for town improvement were raised through public lotteries. In other words, in the early decades of the 19th century raising funds for the city was still thought to be the responsibility of public-minded citizens and not exclusively that of the government. The Lottery Committee commissioned a new map of the city so as to get a comprehensive picture of Calcutta. Among the committee's major activities was road building in the Indian part of the city and clearing the river bank of encroachments. In its drive to make the Indian areas of Calcutta cleaner, the committee removed many huts and displaced the laboring poor, who were now pushed to the outskirts of Calcutta. The threat of epidemics gave a further impetus to town planning in the next few decades. 
Cholera started spreading from 1817 and in 1896 plague made its appearance. The cause of these diseases had not yet been established firmly by medical science. The government proceeded on the basis of the accepted theory of the time, that there was a direct correlation between living conditions and the spread of disease. Such views were supported by prominent Indian merchants in the city, such as Dwarkanath Tagore and Rustam G. Kaosji, who felt that Calcutta needed to be made more healthy. Densely built-up areas were seen as insanitary since they obstructed direct sunlight and circulation of air. That was why working people's huts or busties became the target of demolition. The poor in the city workers, hawkers, artisans, porters, and the unemployed were once again forced to move to distant parts of the city. Frequent fires also led to stricter building regulations for instance, thatched huts were banned in 1836 and tiled roofs made mandatory. By the late 19th century, official intervention in the city became more stringent. Gone were the days when town planning was seen as a task to be shared by inhabitants and the government. Instead, the government took over all the initiatives for town planning including funding. This opportunity was used to clear more huts and develop the British portions of the town at the expense of other areas. The existing racial divide of the white town and black town was reinforced by the new divide of healthy and unhealthy. Indian representatives in the municipality protested against this unfair bias towards the development of the European parts of the town. Public protests against these government policies strengthened the feeling of anti-colonialism and nationalism among Indians. With the growth of their empire, the British became increasingly inclined to make cities like Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras into impressive imperial capitals. It was as if the grandeur of the cities had to reflect the authority of imperial power. Town planning had to represent everything that the British claimed to stand for, rational ordering, meticulous execution, and western aesthetic ideals. Cities had to be cleaned and ordered, planned, and beautified. 4.3 Architecture in Bombay If one way of realizing this imperial vision was through town planning, the other was through embellishing cities with monumental buildings. Buildings in cities could include forts, government offices, educational institutions, religious structures, commemorative towers, commercial depots, or even docks and bridges. Although primarily serving functional needs like defense, administration, and commerce these were rarely simple structures. They were often meant to represent ideas such as imperial power, nationalism, and religious glory. Let us see how this is exemplified in the case of Bombay. Bombay was initially seven islands. As the population grew, the islands were joined to create more space and they gradually fused into one big city. Bombay was the commercial capital of colonial India. As the premier port on the western coast it was the center of international trade. By the end of the 19th century, half the imports and exports of India passed through Bombay. One important item of this trade was opium that the East India Company exported to China. Indian merchants and middlemen supplied and participated in this trade and they helped integrate Bombay's economy directly to Malwa, Rajasthan, and Sindh where opium was grown. This collaboration with the company was profitable and led to the growth of an Indian capitalist class. Bombay's capitalists came from diverse communities such as Parsi, Marwari, Konkani Muslim, Gujarati Bania, Bara, Jew, and Armenian. As you have read, Chapter 10 when the American Civil War started in 1861 cotton from the American South stopped coming into the international market. This led to an upsurge of demand for Indian cotton, grown primarily in the Deccan. Once again Indian merchants and middlemen found an opportunity for earning huge profits. In 1869 the Suez Canal was opened and this further strengthened Bombay's links with the world economy. The Bombay government and Indian merchants used this opportunity to declare Bombay herbs prima in Indies, a Latin phrase meaning the most important city of India. By the late 19th century Indian merchants in Bombay were investing their wealth in new ventures such as cotton mills. They also patronized building activity in the city. As Bombay's economy grew, from the mid-19th century there was a need to expand railways and shipping and develop the administrative structure. Many new buildings were constructed at this time. 
These buildings reflected the culture and confidence of the rulers. The architectural style was usually European. This importation of European styles reflected the imperial vision in several ways. First, it expressed the British desire to create a familiar landscape in an alien country, and thus to feel at home in the colony. Second, the British felt that European styles would best symbolize their superiority, authority, and power. Third, they thought that buildings that looked European would mark out the difference and distance between the colonial masters and their Indian subjects. Initially, these buildings were at odds with the traditional Indian buildings. Gradually, Indians too got used to European architecture and made it their own. The British in turn adapted some Indian styles to suit their needs. One example is the bungalow which was used by government officers in Bombay and all over India. The name bungalow was derived from Bangla, a traditional thatched Bengali hut. The colonial bungalow was set on extensive grounds which ensured privacy and marked a distance from the Indian world around. The traditional pitched roof and surrounding veranda kept the bungalow cool in the summer months. The compound had separate quarters for a retinue of domestic servants. The bungalows in the civil lines thus became a racially exclusive enclave in which the ruling classes could live self-sufficient lives without daily social contact with Indians. For pubic buildings three broad architectural styles were used. Two of these were direct imports from fashions prevalent in England. The first was called neoclassical or the new classical. Its characteristics included construction of geometrical structures fronted with lofty pillars it was derived from a style that was originally typical of buildings in ancient Rome, and was subsequently revived, readapted, and made popular during the European Renaissance. It was considered particularly appropriate for the British Empire in India. The British imagined that a style that embodied the grandeur of Imperial Rome could now be made to express the glory of Imperial India. The Mediterranean origins of this architecture were also thought to be suitable for tropical weather. The town hall in Bombay, figure 12.24, was built in this style in 1833. Another group of commercial buildings, built during the cotton boom of the 1860s, was the Elphinstone Circle. Subsequently named Hornimon Circle after an English editor who courageously supported Indian nationalists, this building was inspired from models in Italy. It made innovative use of covered arcades at ground level to shield the shopper and pedestrian from the fierce sun and rain of Bombay. Another style that was extensively used was the Neo-Gothic, characterized by high-pitched roofs, pointed arches and detailed decoration. The Gothic style had its roots in buildings, especially churches, built in Northern Europe during the medieval period. The Neo-Gothic or New Gothic style was revived in the mid-19th century in England. This was the time when the government in Bombay was building its infrastructure and this style was adapted for Bombay. An impressive group of buildings facing the seafront including the Secretariat, University of Bombay and High Court were all built in this style. Indians gave money for some of these buildings. The University Hall was made with money donated by Sir Kaos G. Jongir Reddy Money a rich Parsi merchant. The University Library Clock Tower was similarly funded by the banker Prem Chand Roychand and was named after his mother as Rajabai Tower. Indian merchants were happy to adopt the Neo-Gothic style since they believed that building styles, like many ideas brought in by the English, were progressive and would help make Bombay into a modern city. However, the most spectacular example of the Neo-Gothic style is the Victoria Terminus, the station and headquarters of the Great Indian Peninsular Railway Company. The British invested a lot in the design and construction of railway stations and cities, since they were proud of having successfully built an all-India railway network. As a group these buildings dominated the central Bombay skyline and their uniform Neo-Gothic style gave a distinctive character to the city. Towards the beginning of the 20th century a new hybrid architectural style developed which combined the Indian with the European. This was called Indo-Saracenic. Indo was shorthand for Hindu and Saracen was a term Europeans used to designate Muslim. The inspiration for this style was medieval buildings in India with their domes, chhatris, jollies, arches. By integrating Indian and European styles in public architecture the British wanted to prove that they were legitimate rulers of India. 
The Gateway of India, built in the traditional Gujarati style to welcome King George V and Queen Mary to India in 1911, is the most famous example of this style. The industrialist Jamzat G. Tata built the Taj Mahal Hotel in a similar style. Besides being a symbol of Indian enterprise, this building became a challenge to the racially exclusive clubs and hotels maintained by the British. In the more Indian localities of Bombay traditional styles of decoration and building predominated. The lack of space in the city and crowding led to a type of building unique to Bombay, the Chal, the multi-storied single-room apartments with long open corridors built around a courtyard. Such buildings which housed many families sharing common spaces helped in the growth of neighborhood identity and solidarity. 5. What buildings and architectural styles tell us? Architecture reflects the aesthetic ideals prevalent at a time, and variations within those ideals. But, as we have seen, buildings also express the vision of those who build them. Rulers everywhere seek to express their power through buildings. So by looking at the architecture of a particular time, we can understand how power was conceived of and how it was expressed through structures and their attributes bricks and stones, pillars and arches, soaring domes or vaulted roofs. Architectural styles do not only reflect prevalent tastes. They mold tastes, popularize styles, and shape the contours of culture. As we have seen, many Indians came to regard European styles of architecture as symbols of modernity and civilization, and began adopting these styles. But not all Indians thought alike, many rejected European ideals and tried to retain indigenous styles, others accepted certain elements from the West that they saw as modern and combined these with elements drawn from local traditions. From the late 19th century we see efforts to define regional and national tastes that were different from the colonial ideal. Styles thus changed and developed through wider processes of cultural conflict. By looking at architecture therefore we can also understand the variety of forms in which cultural conflicts unfolded and political conflicts between the imperial and the national, the national, and the regional slash local were played out. Timeline 1500 to 1700 European trading companies establish bases in India, the Portuguese in Panaji in 1510, the Dutch in Masulaputnam. 1605, the British in Madras in 1639, in Bombay in 1661, and in Calcutta in 1690, the French in Pondicherry in 1673. 1757 Decisive victory of the British in the Battle of Plassey. The British become rulers of Bengal. 1773, Supreme Court set up Indiana Calcutta by the East India Company. 1803 Lord Wellesley's minute on Calcutta town improvement. 1818 British takeover of the Deccan, Bombay becomes the capital of the new province. 1853 Railway from Bombay to Thane. 1857 First spinning and weaving mill in Bombay. 1857 Universities in Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. 1870s Beginning of elected representatives in municipalities. 1881 Madras Harbour completed. 1896 First screening of a film at Watson's Hotel, Bombay. 1896 Plague starts spreading to major cities. 1911 Transfer of capital from Calcutta to Delhi. Source 1. Escaping to the countryside. This is how the famous poet Mirza Ghalib described what the people of Delhi did when the British forces occupied the city in 1857. Smiting the enemy and driving him before them, the victors, I. E. The British, overran the city in all directions. All whom they found in the street they cut down. For two to three days every road in the city, from the Kashmiri Gate to Chandni Chowk, was a battlefield. Three gates the Ajmerai, the Turkoman, and the Delhi were still held by the rebels. At the naked spectacle of this vengeful wrath and malevolent hatred the color fled from men's faces, and a vast concourse of men and women, took to precipitate flight through these three gates. 
Seeking the little villages and shrines outside the city, they drew breath to wait until such time as might favor their return. The Coat Wall of Delhi Did you know that the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru's grandfather, Gangadhar Nehru, was the Coat Wall of Delhi before the revolt of 1857? Read Jawaharlal Nehru, Autobiography, for more details. Kasbah is a small town in the countryside, often the seat of a local notable. Ganjay refers to a small fixed market. Both Kasbah and Ganjay dealt in cloth, fruit, vegetables, and milk products. They provided for noble families and the army. Aims of Cities Madras, Bombay, and Calcutta were the anglicized names of villages where the British first set up trading posts. They are now known as Jinnah, Mumbai, and Kolkata respectively. What Maps Reveal and Conceal The development of survey methods, accurate scientific instruments and British imperial needs meant that maps were prepared with great care. The Survey of India was established in 1878. While the maps that were prepared give us a lot of information, they also reflect the bias of the British rulers. Large settlements of the poor in towns went unmarked on maps because they seemed unimportant to the rulers. As a result it was assumed that these blank spaces on the map were available for other development schemes. When these schemes were undertaken, the poor were evicted. Urbanization in India 1891-1941 Year percentage of urban population to total population 1891 10.0 1901-10.0 1911-9.4 1921-10.2 1931-11.1 1941-12.8 Ionic was one of the three orders organizational systems, of ancient Greek architecture, the other two being Doric, and Corinthian. One feature that distinguished each order was the style of the capital at the head of the columns. These forms were readapted in the Renaissance and neoclassical forms of architecture. Amar Katha, My Story Binodini Dasi, 1863-1941 was a pioneering figure in Bengali theatre in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and worked closely with the dramatist and director Girish Chandra Ghosh, 1844-1912. She was one of the prime movers behind the setting up of the Star Theatre, 1883, in Calcutta which became a centre for famous productions. Between 1910 and 1913 she serialised her autobiography, Amar Katha, my story. A remarkable personality, she exemplified the problem women faced in recasting their roles in society. She was a professional in the city, working in multiple spheres as an actress, institution builder, and author but the patriarchal society of the time scorned her assertive public presence. Source 2. Through the Eyes of Poor Migrants. This is a swung that was popular amongst the inhabitants of Jalapara, Fisherman's Quarter, Calcutta, in the early 20th century. Dilmi e k bhavna s e kakatam iya kaisan kaisan maha ham hi iya dekni paya orisamaj, brahma samaj, gurja, majad e k lotame milta dud, pani, s a b chij kota bara admi s a b, behar kar k det yahapat mar k bolta hai, angrija me bat. With anticipation in my heart I came to Calcutta and what entertaining things I could see here. The area Samaj, Brahmo Samaj, church, and mosque in one vessel you get everything milk, water and all all men big and small show their teeth. And with a flourish they speak in English. Pet is a Tamil word meaning settlement, while Param is used for a village. Source 3. A Rural City? Read this excerpt on Madras from the Imperial Gazetteer, 1908. The better European residences are built in the midst of compounds which almost attain the dignity of parks, and rice fields frequently wind in and out between these in almost rural fashion. Even in the most thickly peopled native quarters such as Blacktown and Triplicane, there is little of the crowding found in many other towns. The Line of Fire Interestingly, the pattern devised for Calcutta was replicated in many other towns. During the revolt of 1857 many towns became rebel strongholds. 
After their victory the British proceeded to make these places safe for themselves. In Delhi for instance they took over the Red Fort and stationed an army there. Then they destroyed buildings close to the fort creating a substantial empty space between the Indian neighborhoods and the fort. The logic was the same as in Calcutta a hundred years ago, a direct line of fire was considered essential, just in case the town rose up against Firji Raj once again. Source 4 For the regulation of nuisances of every description By the early 19th century the British felt that permanent and public rules had to be formulated for regulating all aspects of social life. Even the construction of private buildings and public roads ought to conform to standardized rules that were clearly codified. In his Minute on Calcutta, 1803, Wellesley wrote, it is a primary duty of government to provide for the health, safety, and convenience of the inhabitants of this great town, by establishing a comprehensive system for the improvement of roads, streets, public drains, and water courses, and by fixing permanent rules for the construction and distribution of the houses and public edifices, and for the regulation of nuisances of every description. Busti, in Bengali and Hindi, originally meant neighborhood or settlement. However, the British narrowed the sense of the word to mean makeshift huts built by the poor. In the late 19th century busties and insanitary slums became synonymous in British records. Pitched roof is a term used by architects to describe a sloping roof. By the early 20th century pitched roofs became less common in bungalows, although the general plan remained the same. Theme 13 Mahatma Gandhi and the Nationalist Movement civil disobedience and beyond. In the history of nationalism a single individual is often identified with the making of a nation. Thus, for example, we associate Garibaldi with the making of Italy, George Washington with the American War of Independence, and Ho Chi Minh with the struggle to free Vietnam from colonial rule. In the same manner, Mahatma Gandhi has been regarded as the father of the Indian nation. In so far as Gandhiji was the most influential and revered of all the leaders who participated in the freedom struggle, that characterization is not misplaced. However, like Washington or Ho Chi Minh, Mahatma Gandhi's political career was shaped and constrained by the society in which he lived. For individuals, even great ones, are made by history even as they make history. This chapter analyses Gandhiji's activities in India during the crucial period 1915-1948. It explores his interactions with different sections of the Indian society and the popular struggles that he inspired and led. It introduces the student to the different kinds of sources that historians use in reconstructing the career of a leader and of the social movements that he was associated with. 1. A leader announces himself. In January 1915, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi returned to his homeland after two decades of residence abroad. These years had been spent for the most part in South Africa, where he went as a lawyer, and in time became a leader of the Indian community in that territory. As the historian Chandran Devanesan has remarked, South Africa was the making of the Mahatma. It was in South Africa that Mahatma Gandhi first forged the distinctive techniques of nonviolent protest known as Satyagraha, first promoted harmony between religions, and first alerted upper caste Indians to their discriminatory treatment of low castes and women. The India that Mahatma Gandhi came back to in 1915 was rather different from the one that he had left in 1893. Although still a colony of the British, it was far more active in a political sense. The Indian National Congress now had branches in most major cities and towns. Through the Swadeshi movement of 1905-07 it had greatly broadened its appeal among the middle classes. That movement had thrown up some towering leaders among them B.A.L. Gungadhar Tilak of Maharashtra, Bipin Chandra Pal of Bengal, and Lala Lajpat Rai of Punjab. The three were known as Lao, B.A.L. and Pal the alliteration conveying the all-India character of their struggle, since their native provinces were very distant from one another. Where these leaders advocated militant opposition to colonial rule, there was a group of moderates who preferred a more gradual and persuasive approach. Among these moderates was Gandhiji's acknowledged political mentor, Gopal Krishna Gokula, as well as Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who, 
like Gandhiji, was a lawyer of Gujarati extraction trained in London. On Gokula's advice, Gandhiji spent a year travelling around British India, getting to know the land and its peoples. His first major public appearance was at the opening of the Banaras Hindu University, BHU, in February 1916. Among the invitees to this event were the princes and philanthropists whose donations had contributed to the founding of the BHU. Also present were important leaders of the Congress, such as Annie Besant. Compared to these dignitaries, Gandhiji was relatively unknown. He had been invited on account of his work in South Africa, rather than his status within India. When his turn came to speak, Gandhiji charged the Indian elite with a lack of concern for the laboring poor. The opening of the BHU, he said, was certainly a most gorgeous show. But he worried about the contrast between the richly bedecked noblemen present and millions of the poor Indians who were absent. Gandhiji told the privileged invitees that there is no salvation for India unless you strip yourself of this jewellery and hold it in trust for your countrymen in India. There can be no spirit of self-government about us, he went on, if we take away or allow others to take away from the peasants almost the whole of the results of their labour. Our salvation can only come through the farmer. Neither the lawyers, nor the doctors, nor the rich landlords are going to secure it. The opening of the BHU was an occasion for celebration, marking as it did the opening of a nationalist university, sustained by Indian money and Indian initiative. But rather than adopt a tone of self-congratulation, Gandhiji chose instead to remind those present of the peasants and workers who constituted a majority of the Indian population, yet were unrepresented in the audience. Gandhiji's speech at Banaras in February 1916 was, at one level, merely a statement of fact namely, that Indian nationalism was an elite phenomenon, a creation of lawyers and doctors and landlords. But, at another level, it was also a statement of intent the first public announcement of Gandhiji's own desire to make Indian nationalism more properly representative of the Indian people as a whole. In the last month of that year, Gandhiji was presented with an opportunity to put his precepts into practice. At the annual Congress, held in Lucknow in December 1916, he was approached by a peasant from Champaran in Bihar, who told him about the harsh treatment of peasants by British indigo planters. 2. The Making and Unmaking of Non-Cooperation Mahatma Gandhi was to spend much of 1917 in Champaran, seeking to obtain for the peasants security of tenure as well as the freedom to cultivate the crops of their choice. The following year, 1918, Gandhiji was involved in two campaigns in his home state of Gujarat. First, he intervened in a labor dispute in Ahmedabad, demanding better working conditions for the textile mill workers. Then he joined peasants in Kedah in asking the state for the remission of taxes following the failure of their harvest. These initiatives in Champaran, Ahmedabad and Kedah marked Gandhiji out as a nationalist with a deep sympathy for the poor. At the same time, these were all localized struggles. Then, in 1919, the colonial rulers delivered into Gandhiji's lap an issue from which he could construct a much wider movement. During the Great War of 1914-1918, the British had instituted censorship of the press and permitted detention without trial. Now, on the recommendation of a committee chaired by Sir Sidney Rollat, these tough measures were continued. In response, Gandhiji called for a countrywide campaign against the Rollat Act. In towns across North and West India, life came to a standstill, as shops shut down and schools closed in response to the bond call. The protests were particularly intense in the Punjab, where many men had served on the British side in the war expecting to be rewarded for their service. Instead they were given the Rollat Act. Gandhiji was detained while proceeding to the Punjab even as prominent local congressmen were arrested. The situation in the province grew progressively more tense, reaching a bloody climax in Amritsar in April 1919, when a British brigadier ordered his troops to open fire on a nationalist meeting. More than 400 people were killed in what is known as the Jallianwala Baha massacre. It was the Rolat Satyagraha that made Gandhiji a truly national leader. Emboldened by its success, Gandhiji called for a campaign of non-cooperation with British rule. 
Indians who wished colonialism to end were asked to stop attending schools, colleges, and law courts, and not pay taxes. In sum, they were asked to adhere to a renunciation of, all, voluntary association with the, British, government. If non-cooperation was effectively carried out, said Gandhiji, India would win Swaraj within a year. To further broaden the struggle he had joined hands with the Caliphate movement that sought to restore the Caliphate, a symbol of Pan-Islamism which had recently been abolished by the Turkish ruler Kemal Ataturk. 2.1 Knitting a Popular Movement Gandhiji hoped that by coupling non-cooperation with Caliphate, India's two major religious communities, Hindus and Muslims, could collectively bring an end to colonial rule. These movements certainly unleashed a surge of popular action that was altogether unprecedented in colonial India. Students stopped going to schools and colleges run by the government. Lawyers refused to attend court. The working class went on strike in many towns and cities, according to official figures, there were 396 strikes in 1921, involving 600,000 workers and a loss of 7 million workdays. The countryside was seething with discontent too. Hill tribes in northern Andhra violated the forest laws. Farmers in Awad did not pay taxes. Peasants in Kumon refused to carry loads for colonial officials. These protest movements were sometimes carried out in defiance of the local nationalist leadership. Peasants, workers and others interpreted and acted upon the call to non-cooperate with colonial rule in ways that best suited their interests, rather than conform to the dictates laid down from above. Non-cooperation, wrote Mahatma Gandhi's American biographer Louis Fisher, became the name of an epoch in the life of India and of Gandhiji. Non-cooperation was negative enough to be peaceful but positive enough to be effective. It entailed denial, renunciation, and self-discipline. It was training for self-rule. As a consequence of the non-cooperation movement the British Raj was shaken to its foundations for the first time since the revolt of 1857. Then, in February 1922, a group of peasants attacked and torched a police station in the hamlet of Sri Shri in the United Provinces, now, Uttar Pradesh and Uttaranchal. Several constables perished in the conflagration. This act of violence prompted Gandhiji to call off the movement altogether. No provocation, he insisted, can possibly justify, the, brutal murder of men who had been rendered defenseless and who had virtually thrown themselves on the mercy of the mob. During the non-cooperation movement thousands of Indians were put in jail. Gandhiji himself was arrested in March 1922, and charged with sedition. The judge who presided over his trial, Justice C.N. Broomfield, made a remarkable speech while pronouncing his sentence. It would be impossible to ignore the fact, remarked the judge, that you are in a different category from any person I have ever tried or am likely to try. It would be impossible to ignore the fact that, in the eyes of millions of your countrymen, you are a great patriot and a leader. Even those who differ from you in politics look upon you as a man of high ideals and of even saintly life. Since Gandhiji had violated the law it was obligatory for the bench to sentence him to six years imprisonment, but, said Judge Broomfield, if the course of events in India should make it possible for the government to reduce the period and release you, no one will be better pleased than I. 2.2 A People's Leader By 1922, Gandhiji had transformed Indian nationalism, thereby redeeming the promise he made in his BHU speech of February 1916. It was no longer a movement of professionals and intellectuals, now, hundreds of thousands of peasants, workers and artisans also participated in it. Many of them venerated Gandhiji, referring to him as their Mahatma. They appreciated the fact that he dressed like them, lived like them, and spoke their language. Unlike other leaders he did not stand apart from the common folk, but empathized and even identified with them. This identification was strikingly reflected in his dress, while other nationalist leaders dressed formally, wearing a western suit or an Indian band gala, Gandhiji went among the people in a simple dhoti or loincloth. Meanwhile, he spent part of each day working on the charka, spinning wheel, and encouraged other nationalists to do likewise. 
The act of spinning allowed Gandhiji to break the boundaries that prevailed within the traditional caste system, between mental labor and manual labor. In a fascinating study, the historian Shahid Amin has traced the image of Mahatma Gandhi among the peasants of eastern Uttar Pradesh, as conveyed by reports and rumors in the local press. When he traveled through the region in February 1921, Gandhiji was received by adoring crowds everywhere. This is how a Hindi newspaper in Gorakhpur reported the atmosphere during his speeches. At Batna Gandhiji addressed the local public and then the train started for Gorakhpur. There were not less than 15,000 to 20,000 people at Nankar, Deoria, Gauri Bazar, Shrishrai, and Kuzumhai, stations. Mahatmaji was very pleased to witness the scene at Kuzumhai, as despite the fact that the station is in the middle of a jungle there were not less than 10,000 people here. Some, overcome with their love, were seen to be crying. At Deoria people wanted to give bent, donations, to Gandhiji, but he asked them to give these at Gorakhpur. But at Shri Shri one Marwari gentleman managed to hand over something to him. Then there was no stopping. A sheet was spread and currency notes and coins started raining. It was a sight. Outside the Gorakhpur station the Mahatma was stood on a high carriage and people had a good darshan of him for a couple of minutes. Wherever Gandhiji went, rumors spread of his miraculous powers. In some places it was said that he had been sent by the king to redress the grievances of the farmers, and that he had the power to overrule all local officials. In other places it was claimed that Gandhiji's power was superior to that of the English monarch, and that with his arrival the colonial rulers would flee the district. There were also stories reporting dire consequences for those who opposed him, rumors spread of how villagers who criticized Gandhiji found their houses mysteriously falling apart or their crops failing. Known variously as Gandhi Baba, Gandhi Maharaj, or simply as Mahatma, Gandhiji appeared to the Indian peasant as a savior who would rescue them from high taxes and oppressive officials and restore dignity and autonomy to their lives. Gandhiji's appeal among the poor, and peasants in particular, was enhanced by his ascetic lifestyle, and by his shrewd use of symbols such as the dhoti and the charka. Mahatma Gandhi was by caste a merchant, and by profession a lawyer, but his simple lifestyle and love of working with his hands allowed him to empathize more fully with the laboring poor and for them, in turn, to empathize with him. Where most other politicians talked down to them, Gandhiji appeared not just to look like them, but to understand them and relate to their lives. While Mahatma Gandhi's mass appeal was undoubtedly genuine and in the context of Indian politics, without precedent it must also be stressed that his success in broadening the basis of nationalism was based on careful organization. New branches of the Congress were set up in various parts of India. A series of Prajamandals were established to promote the nationalist creed in the princely states. Gandhiji encouraged the communication of the nationalist message in the mother tongue, rather than in the language of the rulers, English. Thus the provincial committees of the Congress were based on linguistic regions, rather than on the artificial boundaries of British India. In these different ways nationalism was taken to the farthest corners of the country and embraced by social groups previously untouched by it. By now, among the supporters of the Congress were some very prosperous businessmen and industrialists. Indian entrepreneurs were quick to recognize that, in a free India, the favors enjoyed by their British competitors would come to an end. Some of these entrepreneurs, such as G.D. Birla, supported the national movement openly, others did so tacitly. Thus, among Gandhiji's admirers were both poor peasants and rich industrialists, although the reasons why peasants followed Gandhiji were somewhat different from, and perhaps opposed to, the reasons of the industrialists. While Mahatma Gandhi's own role was vital, the growth of what we might call Gandhian nationalism also depended to a very substantial extent on his followers. Between 1917 and 1922, a group of highly talented Indians attached themselves to Gandhiji. They included Mahadev Desai, Vallabhai Bhai Patel, J.B. Kripalani, Subhas Chandra Bose, Abul Kalam Azad, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sarojini Naidu, Govind Vallabhai Pant and C. Rajagopalakari. 
Notably, these close associates of Gandhiji came from different regions as well as different religious traditions. In turn, they inspired countless other Indians to join the Congress and work for it. Mahatma Gandhi was released from prison in February 1924, and now chose to devote his attention to the promotion of homespun cloth, khadi, and the abolition of untouchability. 4. Gandhiji was as much a social reformer as he was a politician. He believed that in order to be worthy of freedom, Indians had to get rid of social evils such as child marriage and untouchability. Indians of one faith had also to cultivate a genuine tolerance for Indians of another hence his emphasis on Hindu-Muslim harmony. Meanwhile, on the economic front Indians had to learn to become self-reliant hence his stress on the significance of wearing khadi rather than mill-made cloth imported from overseas. 3. The Salt Satyagraha A Case Study For several years after the non-cooperation movement ended, Mahatma Gandhi focused on his social reform work. In 1928, however, he began to think of re-entering politics. That year there was an All India campaign in opposition to the All White Simon Commission, sent from England to inquire into conditions in the colony. Gandhiji did not himself participate in this movement, although he gave it his blessings, as he also did to a peasant Satyagraha in Bardoli in the same year. In the end of December 1929, the Congress held its annual session in the city of Lahore. The meeting was significant for two things, the election of Jawaharlal Nehru as president, signifying the passing of the baton of leadership to the younger generation, and the proclamation of commitment to Purna Swaraj, or complete independence. Now the pace of politics picked up once more. On 26 January 1930, Independence Day was observed, with the national flag being hoisted in different venues, and patriotic songs being sung. Gandhiji himself issued precise instructions as to how the day should be observed. It would be good, he said, if the declaration of independence is made by whole villages, whole cities even. It would be well if all the meetings were held at the identical minute in all the places. Gandhiji suggested that the time of the meeting be advertised in the traditional way, by the beating of drums. The celebrations would begin with the hoisting of the national flag. The rest of the day would be spent in doing some constructive work, whether it is spinning, or service of untouchables, or reunion of Hindus and Muslims, or prohibition work, or even all these together, which is not impossible. Participants would take a pledge affirming that it was the inalienable right of the Indian people, as of any other people, to have freedom and to enjoy the fruits of their toil, and that if any government deprives a people of these rights and oppresses them, the people have a further right to alter it or abolish it. 3.1 Dandi Soon after the observance of this Independence Day, Mahatma Gandhi announced that he would lead a march to break one of the most widely disliked laws in British India, which gave the state a monopoly in the manufacture and sale of salt. His picking on the salt monopoly was another illustration of Gandhiji's tactical wisdom. For in every Indian household, salt was indispensable, yet people were forbidden from making salt even for domestic use, compelling them to buy it from shops at a high price. The state monopoly over salt was deeply unpopular, by making it his target, Gandhiji hoped to mobilize a wider discontent against British rule. Where most Indians understood the significance of Gandhiji's challenge, the British Raj apparently did. Not. Although Gandhiji had given advance notice of his salt march to the Viceroy Lord Irwin, Irwin failed to grasp the significance of the action. On March 12, 1930, Gandhiji began walking from his ashram at Sabarmati towards the ocean. He reached his destination three weeks later, making a fistful of salt as he did and thereby making himself a criminal in the eyes of the law. Meanwhile, parallel salt marches were being conducted in other parts of the country. As with non-cooperation, apart from the officially sanctioned nationalist campaign, there were numerous other streams of protest. Across large parts of India, peasants breached the hated colonial forest laws that kept them and their cattle out of the woods in which they had once roamed freely. In some towns, factory workers went on strike while lawyers boycotted British courts and students refused to attend government-run educational institutions. 
As in 1920-1922, now two Gandhiji's call had encouraged Indians of all classes to make manifest their own discontent with colonial rule. The rulers responded by detaining the dissenters. In the wake of the Salt March, nearly 60,000 Indians were arrested, among them, of course, Gandhiji himself. The progress of Gandhiji's march to the seashore can be traced from the secret reports filed by the police. Officials deputed to monitor his movements. These reproduce the speeches he gave at the villages en route, in which he called upon local officials to renounce government employment and join the freedom struggle. In one village, Wasna, Gandhiji told the upper castes that if you are out for Swaraj you must serve untouchables. You will not get Swaraj merely by the repeal of the salt taxes or other taxes. For Swaraj you must make amends for the wrongs which you did to the untouchables. For Swaraj, Hindus, Muslims, Parsis, and Sikhs will have to unite. These are the steps towards Swaraj. The police spies reported that Gandhiji's meetings were very well attended, by villagers of all castes, and by women as well as men. They observed that thousands of volunteers were flocking to the nationalist cause. Among them were many officials, who had resigned from their posts with the colonial government. Writing to the government, the district superintendent of police remarked, Mr. Gandhi appeared calm and collected. He is gathering more strength as he proceeds. The progress of the Salt March can also be traced from another source, the American news magazine, Time. This, to begin with, scorned at Gandhiji's looks, writing with disdain of his spindly frame and his spidery loins. Thus in its first report on the march, Time was deeply skeptical of the salt march reaching its destination. It claimed that Gandhiji sank to the ground at the end of the second day's walking, the magazine did not believe that the emaciated saint would be physically able to go much further. But within a week it had changed its mind. The massive popular following that the march had garnered, wrote. Time, had made the British rulers desperately anxious. Gandhiji himself they now saluted as a saint. And statesman, who was using Christian acts as a weapon against men with Christian beliefs. 3.2 Dialogues The Salt March was notable for at least three reasons. First, it was this event that first brought Mahatma Gandhi to world attention. The march was widely covered by the European and American press. Second, it was the first nationalist activity in which women participated in large numbers. The socialist activist Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay had persuaded Gandhiji not to restrict the protests to men alone. Kamala Devi was herself one of numerous women who courted arrest by breaking the salt or liquor laws. Third, and perhaps most significant, it was the salt march which forced upon the British the realization that their Raj would not last forever, and that they would have to devolve some power to the Indians. To that end, the British government convened a series of round-table conferences in London. The first meeting was held in November 1930, but without the preeminent political leader in India, thus rendering it an exercise in futility. Gandhiji was released from jail in January 1931 and the following month had several long meetings with the Viceroy. These culminated in what was called the Gandhi Irwin Pact, by the terms of which civil disobedience would be called off, all prisoners released, and salt manufacture allowed along the coast. The pact was criticized by radical nationalists, for Gandhiji was unable to obtain from the Viceroy a commitment to political independence for Indians he could obtain merely an assurance of talks towards that possible end. A second round table conference was held in London in the latter part of 1931. Here, Gandhiji represented the Congress. However, his claims that his party represented all of India came under challenge from three parties, from the Muslim League, which claimed to stand for the interests of the Muslim minority, from the princes, who claimed that the Congress had no stake in their territories, and from the brilliant lawyer and thinker B.R. Ambedkar, who argued that Gandhiji and the Congress did not really represent the lowest castes. The conference in London was inconclusive, so Gandhiji returned to India and resumed civil disobedience. The new Viceroy, Lord Willingdon, was deeply unsympathetic to the Indian leader. In a private letter to his sister, Willingdon wrote, 
it is a beautiful world if it was not for Gandhi. At the bottom of every move he makes which he always says is inspired by God, one discovers the political maneuver. I see the American press is saying what a wonderful man he is. But the fact is that we live in the midst of very unpractical, mystical, and superstitious folk who look upon Gandhi as something holy. In 1935, however, a new government of India Act promised some form of representative government. Two years later, in an election held on the basis of a restricted franchise, the Congress won a comprehensive victory. Now eight out of eleven provinces had a Congress Prime Minister, working under the supervision of a British governor. In September 1939, two years after the Congress Ministries assumed office, the Second World War broke out. Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru had both been strongly critical of Hitler and the Nazis. Accordingly, they promised Congress support to the war effort if the British, in return, promised to grant India independence once hostilities ended. The offer was refused. In protest, the Congress ministries resigned in October 1939. Through 1940 and 1941, the Congress organized a series of individual satyagrahas to pressure the rulers to promise freedom once the war had ended. Meanwhile, in March 1940, the Muslim League passed a resolution committing itself to the creation of a separate nation called Pakistan. The political landscape was now complicated, it was no longer Indians versus the British, rather, it had become a three-way struggle between the Congress, the Muslim League, and the British. At this time Britain had an all-party government, whose Labour members were sympathetic to Indian aspirations, but whose Conservative Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was a diehard imperialist who insisted that he had not been appointed the King's First Minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. In the spring of 1942, Churchill was persuaded to send one of his ministers, Sir Stafford Cripps, to India to try and forge a compromise with Gandhiji and the Congress. Talks broke down, however, after the Congress insisted that if it was to help the British defend India from the Axis powers, then the Viceroy had first to appoint an Indian as the defense member of his executive council. 4. Quit India After the failure of the Crips mission, Mahatma Gandhi decided to launch his third major movement against British rule. This was the Quit India campaign, which began in August 1942. Although Gandhiji was jailed at once, younger activists organized strikes and acts of sabotage all over the country. Particularly active in the underground resistance were socialist members of the Congress, such as Jayaprakash Narayan. In several districts, such as Satara in the west and Medinipur in the east, independent governments were proclaimed. The British responded with much force, yet it took more than a year to suppress the rebellion. Quit India was genuinely a mass movement, bringing into its ambit hundreds of thousands of ordinary Indians. It especially energized the young who, in very large numbers, left their colleges to go to jail. However, while the Congress leaders languished in jail, Jinnah and his colleagues in the Muslim League worked patiently at expanding their influence. It was in these years that the League began to make a mark in the Punjab and Sindh, provinces where it had previously had scarcely any presence. In June 1944, with the end of the war in sight, Gandhiji was released from prison. Later that year he held a series of meetings with Jinnah, seeking to bridge the gap between the Congress and the League. In 1945, a Labour government came to power in Britain and committed itself to granting independence to India. Meanwhile, back in India, the Viceroy, Lord Wavell, brought the Congress and the League together for a series of talks. Early in 1946 fresh elections were held to the provincial legislatures. The Congress swept the general category, but in the seats specifically reserved for Muslims the League won an overwhelming majority. The political polarization was complete. A cabinet mission sent in the summer of 1946 failed to get the Congress and the League to agree on a federal system that would keep India together while allowing the provinces a degree of autonomy. After the talks broke down, Jinnah called for a direct action day to press the League's demand for Pakistan. On the designated day, August 16, 1946, 
bloody riots broke out in Calcutta. The violence spread to rural Bengal, then to Bihar, and then across the country to the United Provinces and the Punjab. In some places, Muslims were the main sufferers, in other places, Hindus. In February 1947, Wavell was replaced as Viceroy by Lord Mountbatten. Mountbatten called one a last round of talks, but when these two proved inconclusive he announced that British India would be freed, but also divided. The formal transfer of power was fixed for August 15. When that day came, it was celebrated with gusto in different parts of India. In Delhi, there was prolonged applause when the President of the Constituent Assembly began the meeting by invoking the father of the nation Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Outside the Assembly, the crowds shouted Mahatma Gandhi ki jai. 5. The Last Heroic Days As it happened, Mahatma Gandhi was not present at the festivities in the capital on August 15, 1947. He was in Calcutta, but he did not attend any function or hoist a flag there either. Gandhiji marked the day with a 2-4-H-O-U-R fast. The freedom he had struggled so long for had come at an unacceptable price, with the nation divided and Hindus and Muslims at each other's throats. Through September and October, writes his biographer D.G. Tendulkar, Gandhiji went round hospitals and refugee camps giving consolation to distressed people. He appealed to the Sikhs, the Hindus and the Muslims to forget the past and not to dwell on their sufferings but to extend the right hand of fellowship to each other, and to determine to live in peace. At the initiative of Gandhiji and Nehru, the Congress now passed a resolution on the rights of minorities. The party had never accepted the two-nation theory, forced against its will to accept partition, it still believed that India is a land of many religions and many races, and must remain so. Whatever be the situation in Pakistan, India would be a democratic secular state where all citizens enjoy full rights and are equally entitled to the protection of the state, irrespective of the religion to which they belong. The Congress wished to assure the minorities in India that it will continue to protect, to the best of its ability, their citizen rights against aggression. Many scholars have written of the months after independence as being Gandhiji's finest hour. After working to bring peace to Bengal, Gandhiji now shifted to Delhi, from where he hoped to move on to the riot-torn districts of Punjab. While in the capital, his meetings were disrupted by refugees who objected to readings from the Quran, or shouted slogans asking why he did not speak of the sufferings of those Hindus and Sikhs still living in Pakistan. In fact, as D.G. Tendulkar writes, Gandhiji was equally concerned with the sufferings of the minority community in Pakistan. He would have liked to be able to go to their succor. But with what face could he now go there, when he could not guarantee full redress to the Muslims in Delhi? There was an attempt on Gandhiji's life on January 20, 1948, but he carried on undaunted. On 26. January, he spoke at his prayer meeting of how that day had been celebrated in the past as Independence Day. Now freedom had come, but its first few months had been deeply disillusioning. However, he trusted that the worst is over, that Indians would henceforth work collectively for the equality of all classes and creeds never the domination and superiority of the major community over a minor, however insignificant it may be in numbers or influence. He also permitted himself the hope that though geographically and politically India is divided into two, at heart we shall ever be friends and brothers helping and respecting one another and be one for the outside world. Gandhiji had fought a lifelong battle for a free and united India, and yet, when the country was divided, he urged that the two parts respect and befriend one another. Other Indians were less forgiving. At his daily prayer meeting on the evening of January 30, Gandhiji was shot dead by a young man. The assassin, who surrendered afterwards, was a Brahmin from Pun named Nath Uram Godset, the editor of an extremist Hindu newspaper who had denounced Gandhiji as an appeaser of Muslims. Gandhiji's death led to an extraordinary outpouring of grief with rich tributes being paid to him from across the political spectrum in India, and moving appreciations coming from such international figures as George Orwell and Albert Einstein. Time magazine, which had once mocked Gandhiji's physical size and seemingly non-rational ideas, 
now compared his martyrdom to that of Abraham Lincoln, it was a bigoted American who had killed Lincoln for believing that human beings were equal regardless of their race or skin color, and it was a bigoted Hindu who had killed Gandhiji for believing that friendship was possible, indeed necessary, between Indians of different faiths. In this respect, as time wrote, the world knew that it had, in a sense too deep, too simple for the world to understand, connived at his, Gandhiji's, death as it had connived at Lincoln's. 6. Knowing Gandhi There are many different kinds of sources from which we can reconstruct the political career of Gandhiji and the history of the nationalist movement. 6.1 Public Voice and Private Scripts One important source is the writings and speeches of Mahatma Gandhi and his contemporaries, including both his associates and his political adversaries. Within these writings we need to distinguish between those that were meant for the public and those that were not. Speeches, for instance, allow us to hear the public voice of an individual, while private letters give us a glimpse of his or her private thoughts. In letters we see people expressing their anger and pain, their dismay and anxiety, their hopes and frustrations in ways in which they may not express themselves in public statements. But we must remember that this private-public distinction often breaks down. Many letters are written to individuals, and are therefore personal, but they are also meant for the public. The language of the letters is often shaped by the awareness that they may one day be published. Conversely, the fear that a letter may get into print often prevents people from expressing their opinion freely in personal letters. Mahatma Gandhi regularly published in his journal, Harijan, letters that others wrote to him. Nehru edited a collection of letters written to him during the national movement and published a bunch of old letters. 6.2 Framing a Picture Autobiographies similarly give us an account of the past that is often rich in human detail. But here again we have to be careful of the way we read and interpret autobiographies. We need to remember that they are retrospective accounts written very often from memory. They tell us what the author could recollect, what he or she saw as important, or was keen on recounting, or how a person wanted his or her life to be viewed by others. Writing an autobiography is a way of framing a picture of yourself. So in reading these accounts we have to try and see what the author does not tell us, we need to understand the reasons for that silence those willful or unwitting acts of forgetting. 6.3 Through Police Eyes Another vital source is government records, for the colonial rulers kept close tabs on those they regarded as critical of the government. The letters and reports written by policemen and other officials were secret at the time, but now can be accessed in archives. Let us look at one such source, the fortnightly reports that were prepared by the Home Department from the early 20th century. These reports were based on police information from the localities, but often expressed what the higher officials saw or wanted to believe. While noticing the possibility of sedition and rebellion, they liked to assure themselves that these fears were unwarranted. If you see the fortnightly reports for the period of the Salt March you will notice that the home department was unwilling to accept that Mahatma Gandhi's actions had evoked any enthusiastic response from the masses. The march was seen as a drama, an antic a desperate effort to mobilize people who were unwilling to rise against the British and were busy with their daily schedules, happy under the Raj. One from newspapers. One more important source is contemporary newspapers, published in English as well as in the different Indian languages, which tracked Mahatma Gandhi's movements and reported on his activities, and also represented what ordinary Indians thought of him. Newspaper accounts, however, should not be seen as unprejudiced. They were published by people who had their own political opinions and world views. These ideas shaped what was published and the way events were reported. The accounts that were published in a London newspaper would be different from the report in an Indian nationalist paper. We need to look at these reports but should be careful while interpreting them. Every statement made in these cannot be accepted literally as representing what was happening on the ground. They often reflect the fears and anxieties of officials who were unable to control a movement and were anxious about its spread. They did not know whether to arrest Mahatma Gandhi or what an arrest would mean. The more the colonial state kept a watch on the public and its activities, the more it worried about the basis of its rule. Timeline 
1915 Mahatma Gandhi returns from South Africa. 1917 Champaran Movement. 1918 Peasant Movements in Kedah, Gujarat, and Workers' Movement in Ahmedabad. 1919 Rolat Satyagraha, March April. 1919 Jallianwala Bah Massacre, April. 1921 Non Cooperation and Khilafat Movements. 1928 Peasant Movement in Bardoli. 1929 Purnas Waraj accepted as Congress goal at the Lahore Congress. December. 1930 Civil Disobedience Movement begins, Dandi March, March April. 1931 Gandhi Irwin Pact, March, Second Round Table Conference. December. 1935 Government of India Act promises some form of representative government. 1939 Congress Ministries resign. 1942 Quit India Movement begins, August. 1946 Mahatma Gandhi visits Nokhali and other riot-torn areas to stop communal violence. What was the Khilafat Movement? The Khilafat Movement, 1919-1920, was a movement of Indian Muslims, led by Muhammad Ali and Kakut Ali, that demanded the following, the Turkish Sultan or Khalifa must retain control over the Muslim sacred places in the erstwhile Ottoman Empire, the Jazirat al Arab, Arabia, Syria, Iraq, Palestine, must remain under Muslim sovereignty, and the Khalifa must be left with sufficient territory to enable him to defend the Islamic faith. The Congress supported the movement and Mahatma Gandhi sought to conjoin it to the non cooperation movement. Figure 13.5 Mahatma Gandhi with the Charka has become the most abiding image of Indian nationalism. In 1921, during a tour of South India, Gandhiji shaved his head and began wearing a loincloth in order to identify with the poor. His new appearance also came to symbolize asceticism and abstinence qualities he celebrated in opposition to the consumerist culture of the modern world. Source 1. Charka. Mahatma Gandhi was profoundly critical of the modern age in which machines enslaved humans and displaced labor. He saw the charka as a symbol of a human society that would not glorify machines and technology. The spinning wheel, moreover, could provide the poor with supplementary income and make them self-reliant. What I object to, is the craze for machinery as such. The craze is for what they call labor-saving machinery. Men. Go on saving labor, till thousands are without work and thrown on the open streets to die of starvation. I want to save time and labor, not for a fraction of mankind, but for all, I want the concentration of wealth, not in the hands of few, but in the hands of all. YOU5GI5DIA, I3 November 1924 Cotter does not seek to destroy all machinery but it does regulate its use and check its weedy growth. It uses machinery for the service of the poorest in their own cottages. The wheel is itself an exquisite piece of machinery. YOU5GI5DIA, March 17, 1927 Source 2 The Miraculous and the Unbelievable Local newspapers in the United Provinces recorded many of the rumors that circulated at that time. There were rumors that every person who wanted to test the power of the Mahatma had been surprised. 15 Sikha Ndar Sahu from a village in Basti said on February 15 that he would believe in the Mahatmaji when the Kara, boiling pan, full of sugar cane juice in his Karkhana, where Gur was produced, split into two. Immediately the Kara actually split into two from the middle. A cultivator in Azamgarh said that he would believe in the Mahatmaji's authenticity if sesame sprouted on his field planted with wheat. Next day all the wheat in that field became sesame. Source 2, continued. There were rumors that those who opposed Mahatma Gandhi invariably met with some tragedy. 1. A gentleman from Gorakhpur city questioned the need to ply the charka. His house caught fire. 2. In April 1921 some people were gambling in a village of Uttar Pradesh. Someone told them to stop. Only one from amongst the group refused to stop and abused Gandhiji. The next day his goat was bitten by four of his own dogs. 3. In a village in Gorakhpur, 
the peasants resolved to give up drinking liquor. One person did not keep his promise. As soon as he started for the liquor shop Brickbats started to rain in his path. When he spoke the name of Gandhiji the Brickbats stopped flying. From Shahid Amin, Gandhi as Mahatma, Subalter 5 Studies 3 Source 3 Why the Salt Satyagraha? Why was salt the symbol of protest? This is what Mahatma Gandhi wrote. The volume of information being gained daily shows how wickedly the salt tax has been designed. In order to prevent the use of salt that has not paid the tax which is at times even 14 times its value, the government destroys the salt it cannot sell profitably. Thus it taxes the nation's vital necessity, it prevents the public from manufacturing it and destroys what nature manufactures without effort. No adjective is strong enough for characterizing this wicked dog in the manger policy. From various sources I hear tales of such wanton destruction of the nation's property in all parts of India. Mons if not tons of salt are said to be destroyed on the Konkan coast. The same tale comes from Dandi. Wherever there is likelihood of natural salt being taken away by the people living in the neighborhood of such areas for their personal use, salt officers are posted for the sole purpose of carrying on destruction. Thus valuable national property is destroyed at national expense and salt taken out of the mouths of the people. The salt monopoly is thus a fourfold curse. It deprives the people of a valuable easy village industry, involves wanton destruction of property that nature produces in abundance, the destruction itself means more national expenditure, and fourthly, to crown this folly, an unheard of tax of more than 1000% is exacted from a starving people. This tax has remained so long because of the apathy of the general public. Now that it is sufficiently roused, the tax has to go. How soon it will be abolished depends upon the strength of the people. The Collected Works of Mahatma Ga 5 Dhi, CWMG, Volume 49 Source 4 Tomorrow we shall break the salt tax law. On April 5, 1930, Mahatma Gandhi spoke at Dandi. When I left Sabarmati with my companions for this seaside hamlet of Dandi, I was not certain in my mind that we would be allowed to reach this place. Even while I was at Sabarmati there was a rumor that I might be arrested. I had thought that the government might perhaps let my party come as far as Dandi, but not me certainly. If someone says that this betrays imperfect faith on my part, I shall not deny the charge. That I have reached here is in no small measure due to the power of peace and non-violence, that power is universally felt. The government may, if it wishes, congratulate itself on acting as it has done, for it could have arrested every one of us. In saying that it did not have the courage to arrest this army of peace, we praise it. It felt ashamed to arrest such an army. He is a civilized man who feels ashamed to do anything which his neighbors would disapprove. The government deserves to be congratulated on not arresting us, even if it desisted only from fear of world opinion. Tomorrow we shall break the salt tax law. Whether the government will tolerate that is a different question. It may not tolerate it, but it deserves congratulations on the patience and forbearance it has displayed in regard to this party. What if I and all the eminent leaders in Gujarat and in the rest of the country are arrested? This movement is based on the faith that when a whole nation is roused and on the march no leader is necessary. Source 5 The Problem with Separate Electorates CWMG, Volume 49 At the Round Table Conference Mahatma Gandhi stated his arguments against separate electorates for the Depressed Classes Separate electorates to the untouchables will ensure them bondage in perpetuity. Do you want the untouchables to remain untouchables forever? Well, the separate electorates would perpetuate the stigma. What is needed is destruction of untouchability, and when you have done it, the bar sinister, which has been imposed by an insolent superior class upon an inferior class will be destroyed. When you have destroyed the bar sinister to whom will you give the separate electorates? Source 6. Ambedkar on separate electorates. In response to Mahatma Gandhi's opposition to the demand for separate electorates for the depressed classes, Ambedkar wrote, Here is a class which is undoubtedly not in a position to sustain itself in the struggle for existence. The religion, 
to which they are tied, instead of providing them an honorable place, brands them as lepers, not fit for ordinary intercourse. Economically, it is a class entirely dependent upon the high caste Hindus for earning its daily bread with no independent way of living open to it. Nor are all ways closed by reason of the social prejudices of the Hindus but there is a definite attempt all through our Hindu society to bolt every possible door so as not to allow the depressed classes any opportunity to rise in the scale of life. In these circumstances, it would be granted by all fair-minded persons that is the only path for a community so handicapped to succeed in the struggle for life against organized tyranny, some share of political power in order that it may protect itself is a paramount necessity. From Dr. Babasaheb Ambedkar What Congress and Gandhi Have done to the untouchables Sitara, 1943 From the late 19th century, a non-Brahmin movement, which opposed the caste system and landlordism, had developed in Maharashtra. This movement established links with the national movement by the 1930s. In 1943, some of the younger leaders in the Sitara district of Maharashtra set up a parallel government. Prati Sarkar, with volunteer corps. Saba Dals, and village units, Tufan Dals. They ran people's courts and organized constructive work. Dominated by Kunbai peasants and supported by Dalits, the Sitara Prati Sarkar functioned till the elections of 1946, despite government repression and, in the later stages, Congress disapproval. Source 7. One event through letters. In the 1920s, Jawaharlal Nehru was increasingly influenced by socialism, and he returned from Europe in 1928 deeply impressed with the Soviet Union. As he began working closely with the socialists, Jayaprakash Narayan, Narendra Dev, N.G. Ranga and others, a rift developed between the socialists and the conservatives within the Congress. After becoming the Congress president in 1936, Nehru spoke passionately against fascism, and upheld the demands of workers and peasants. Worried by Nehru's socialist rhetoric, the conservatives, led by Rajendra Prasad and Sardar Patel, threatened to resign from the working committee, and some prominent industrialists in Bombay issued a statement attacking Nehru. Both Prasad and Nehru turned to Mahatma Gandhi and met him at his ashram at Wardha. The latter acted as the mediator, as he often did, restraining Nehru's radicalism and persuading Prasad and others to see the significance of Nehru's leadership. In A Bunch of Old Letters, 1958, Nehru reprinted many of the letters that were exchanged at the time. Read the extracts in the following pages. From A Bunch of Old Letters My dear Jawahar Lalji, Wardha, July 1, 1936. Since we parted yesterday we have had a long conversation with Mahatmaji and a prolonged consultation among ourselves. We understand that you have felt much hurt by the course of action taken by us and particularly the tone of our letter has caused you much pain. It was never our intention either to embarrass you or to hurt you and if you had suggested or indicated that it hurt you we would have without the least hesitation amended or altered the letter but we have decided to withdraw it and our resignation on a reconsideration of the whole situation. We have felt that in all your utterances as published in the press you have been speaking not so much on the general Congress program as on a topic which has not been accepted by the Congress and in doing so you have been acting more as the mouthpiece of the minority of our colleagues on the working committee as also on the Congress than the mouthpiece of the majority which we expected you as Congress president to do. There is regular continuous campaign against us treating us as persons whose time is over, who represent and stand for ideas that are worn out and that have no present value, who are only obstructing the progress of the country and who deserve to be cast out of the positions which they undeservedly hold, we have felt that a great injustice has been and is being done to us by others, and we are not receiving the protection we are entitled from you as our colleague and as our president. Yours sincerely. Rajendra Prasad my dear Bapu, Allahabad, July 5, 1936. I arrived here last night. Ever since I left Wardha I have been feeling weak in body and troubled in mind. Since my return from Europe, I found that meetings of the working committee exhaust me greatly, 
they have a devitalising effect on me and I have almost the feeling of being older in years after every fresh experience. I am grateful to you for all the trouble you took in smoothing over matters and in helping to avoid a crisis. I read again Rajendra Babu's letter to me, the second one, and his formidable indictment of me. For however tenderly the fact may be stated, it amounts to this that I am an intolerable nuisance and the very qualities I possess a measure of ability, energy, earnestness, some personality which has a vague appeal.